fiction and non-fiction are only different techniques of storytelling. For reasons that I don't fully understand, fiction dances out of me. And non-fiction is wrenched out by the aching, broken world I wake up to every morning. The theme of much of what I write, fiction as well as non-fiction, is the relationship between power and powerlessness, and the endless circular conflict they're engaged in. Never again will a single story be told as though it's the only one. There can never be a single story. There are only ways of seeing. So when I tell a story, I tell it not as an ideologue who wants to pit one absolutist ideology against another, but as a storyteller who wants to share her way of seeing. Though it might appear otherwise, my writing is not really about nations and histories. It's about power about the paranoia and ruthlessness of power, about the physics of power. I believe that the accumulation of vast, unfettered power by a state or a country, a corporation or an institution, or even an individual, a spouse, a friend, a sibling, regardless of ideology, results in excesses such as the ones I will recount here. Living as I do, as millions of us do, in the shadow of the nuclear holocaust that the governments of India and Pakistan keep promising their brainwashed citizenry, and in the global neighborhood of the war against terror, what President Bush rather biblically calls the task that never ends. I find myself thinking a great deal about the relationship between citizens and the state. In India, those of us who have expressed views on nuclear bombs, big dams, corporate globalization, views that are at variance with the Indian governments are branded anti-national. While this accusation doesn't fill me with indignation, it's not an accurate description of what I do or how I think. Because an anti-national is a person who is against his or her own nation and by inference is pro some other one. But it isn't necessary to be anti-national to be deeply suspicious of all nationalism. To be anti-nationalism. Nationalism of one kind or another was the cause of most of the genocide of the 20th century.
are bits of coloured cloth that governments use first to shrink wrap people's brains and then as ceremonial shrouds to bury the dead. independent thinking people and here I do not include the corporate media begin to rally under flags when writers, painters, musicians, filmmakers suspend their judgment and blindly yoke their art to the service of the nation it's time for all of us to sit up and worry in India we saw it happen soon after the nuclear tests in 1998 and during the Kargil War against Pakistan in 1999. In the US we saw it during the Gulf War and we see it now during the war against terror, that blizzard of made in China American flags. Recently those who have criticized the actions of the US government, myself included, have been called anti-American. Anti-Americanism is in the process of being consecrated into an ideology. The term anti-American is usually used by the American establishment to discredit and not falsely, but shall we say inaccurately, define its critics. Once someone is branded anti-American, the chances are that he or she will be judged before they are heard and the argument will be lost in the welter of brute national pride. So what does the term anti-American mean? Does it mean you're anti-jazz? Or that you're opposed to free speech? Does it mean that you don't admire the hundreds of thousands of American citizens who marched against nuclear weapons? or the thousands of war resistors who forced their government to withdraw from Vietnam. to think that those who criticize the Indian government are anti-Indian, although the government itself never hesitates to take that line. It is dangerous to see